Well, hello, my name is Richard Blaney. I'm the pastor of Brannockstown Baptist Church in County Kildare. Uh, welcome to this presentation for the Irish Baptist Historical Society. I begin with a confession that this address is being delivered a year late. 2020 was to have been the year when we at the church in Brannockstown marked the 150th anniversary of its founding, our sesquicentenary, if you prefer. Uh, but of course, our 2020 vision was somewhat obscured, wasn't it? What a time it's been. Uh, all the same, uh, here we are a year later in 2021, although I'm afraid I, I don't know the formal name for a 151st anniversary. Uh, as we begin, let me thank John Galt and others with the Irish Baptist Historical Society for the kind invitation to share the story of the church. Uh, thanks also to you for watching. And a special word of gratitude to a predecessor of mine, uh, Pastor Robert Dunlop. Uh, most of what I will share is only known to me through his research and writing, and in particular his book, Plantation of Renown, the story of the Latouches of Harristown and the Baptist Church at Brannockstown, at first published for the centenary of the church in 1970. And it's fair to say that without the fruit of Pastor Dunlop's extensive research, I would ha hardly have had the, con the confidence to share the story of the church today. Brannockstown uh, is a tidy little village nestled in the gently rolling pasture land of County Kildare and the River Liffey Valley. Now, it's possible uh, that some watching are made little the wiser for that description, uh, and for you, I provide a map. Uh, now, the first time that I was invited to preach for a Sunday at the church here, I didn't actually know where County Kildare was though in my defense, it was only a short time after I'd returned from living for over 10 years in England. Uh, Brannockstown is around 45 minutes drive southwest of Dublin. It's a settlement dating back in some form or other to the 12th century, uh, which today is a mix of quaint old cottages, stylish newer homes, a school, our church, uh, and many glorious old trees that watch us come and go beneath them. The surrounding countryside is home not only to ordinary farms, but to studs. The horses of Sallymount Stud uh, can be seen grazing through the trees opposite the church and the adjacent manse, uh, while less than a mile to the west is Guildhound Stud, owned by the Aga Khan, uh, visited in 2011 by Queen Elizabeth. In 2017, by Prince Charles and Camilla, and in 2018, by a Baptist youth evangelism team taking a well-earned break. Now, one of the team reflected on the experience afterward, at saying, tonight I stroked the nose of an 80 million euro horse. Uh, now, the Irish name uh, rendered as Brannockstown approximately means town of the Welshman. Uh, but while the history of the village may have roots in Wales, the story of the church begins instead in France. The powerful and influential de la Touche family was favored in the court of King Louis XIV, but the state persecution of Protestant Christians, the Huguenots, in 17th century France prompted part of the family to flee the country. One young de la Touche arrived in Ireland, settled in Dublin, and formed links with other Huguenot refugees who deposited cash and valuables with him for safekeeping. Such were the beginnings of one of the foremost private banks in 18th century Ireland, and the la Touche family became wealthy landowners in Dublin, Wicklow, and Kildare. And so it was that in 1768, one David Latouche uh, bought Kildare's Harristown estate from the prestigious Eustace family, and it became the Latouche family by around the 1780s. Harristown House was noted as the most beautiful seat in that part of Ireland. Uh, the River Liffey still winds its way through the land, and uh, had formed at that time a large lake in front of the house that was used for boating and other water sport. Um, that lake was since filled in and is now a field.
private, uh, but include uh, farmed and forested land uh, and at least uh, two substantial and handsome old masonry arched bridges, uh, one of which, this one, uh, sat on an old railway route that's now long disused. Uh, interestingly, Harristown was recently for sale, uh, although it was a little out of my price range. The estate passed through the family, reaching John Latouche in 1844. Uh, he was a young man in his late 20s, newly married to Maria, uh, an enthusiastic letter writer and author of several novels and other works. The Latouches lived in Victorian times um, and as wealthy upper-class landowners and landlords. That, that's a life we could easily caricature and, and even criticize from what we view as more equitable times today, whether they are or not. I, for one, don't know enough about it to go quite that far, and I'm content to be informed by others that John Latouche seems to have been viewed as firm but fair and even kind-hearted. In his early years of master, as master of Harristown House, he followed what had become a family association with the Church of Ireland and was what could probably be fairly described as a churchgoer. However, his view of spiritual matters went on to change and to change him. There were years when the Latouches would spend winters in London where it seemed that John Latouche made the acquaintance of the well-known Baptist preacher, the Reverend Charles Haddon Spurgeon. In fact, Spurgeon is rumored to have visited and stayed at the Brannockstown Manse, although documentary evidence for this uh, is sadly lacking. Certainly, the, in the winter of 1857, Latouche began listening to Spurgeon preach uh, and at some point, possibly over the next few years, the gospel struck home and changed his life. One writer comments about, quote, a rich Irish banker, former master of the Kildare Hounds, who had recently found the light and been converted and rebaptized by that fire-breathing evangelist, the Reverend C.H. Spurgeon. Another writer enthuses that the master was rescued, quote, out of the blighting narrowness of a life entirely given to sport and enabled to see the beauty of things he never gave a thought to when he was young. That writer goes on with Latouche in mind, at saying people may talk of goodness narrowing people, but experience proves that spiritual interest enlarges the nature of a person and widens their life. The grace of God in Jesus Christ came to John Latouche and certainly enlarged his nature and his interests. He quickly identified himself with Christian relief work in London, founding a society that helped to deliver 500 young women from prostitution, and then taking an interest in the work of the London City Mission. Interestingly, until the restrictions of the current pandemic the church here in Brannockstown enjoyed an annual visit from a couple of London City Mission workers to update us on some aspect or other of the efforts of that large network. Although that present relationship owes more to the interest of some of our current members than to that of John Latouche 150 years ago. Back in Kildare, Latouche carried out compassion work in the neighbouring town of Nace, and laid the foundation stone of the new Nace Presbyterian Church building, which is still home to a congregation with whom we have a very friendly relationship today. Around 1870, Latouche began to gather a group of tenants and neighbors for Bible studies at Harris Town House, and later in a cottage in the village in which he and his family lived while Harris Town House was rebuilt after a serious fire. The precise date of the church's formation is unknown, which might seem like a remarkable admission uh, by someone who took the trouble of learning the word sesquicentenary. Uh, documents suggest that a congregation was meeting officially as a Baptist church by 1873, with some correspondence suggesting that regular services had begun at an earlier time. In any case, the centenary celebrations of the church were held in 1970 
under the leadership of Pastor Dunlop, who, as I mentioned, literally wrote the book on the history of the church. And so, global pandemic aside, uh, we have no reasons really to change the dates. Um, it is perhaps a marker of how Ireland has changed that the centenary of the church featured a service broadcast by RTE. Uh, although, to be fair, we, we didn't ask RTE if there would be any interest in our latest anniversary. Um, one report from the 1880s describes the founding of the church uh, as follows. Mr. Latouche has even shown an eager interest in the social and moral well-being of his tenantry. Nearly 20 years ago, he was led to see the scripturalness of our views of baptism. Earnestly desiring to serve Christ, he devoted himself for a time to evangelistic work in London. But the spiritual destitution of his own country, and especially of the neighborhood in which he was most interested, induced him to return to Brannockstown and endeavor in some way to evangelize the people there. He commenced by holding a prayer meeting in a cottage and giving short expositions of the Bible narratives. At length, a cottage was specially fitted for the purpose and services held regularly on Sundays. Several were converted at these meetings and ultimately baptized. In due time, a little church was formed to which Mr. Latouche continued to minister. At length, finding his strength unequal to the full strain of pastoral work, he obtained for a few years occasional help from various ministers in Great Britain and Ireland. It's worth admitting that there is a lingering question of whether tenants and employees of the master of Harristown were expected to attend the services in Brannock's town. In the years since then, some have even maintained that regular attendance of the Baptist church was a condition of employment at Harris Town. Now, these suspicions are probably not without some foundation. And though there's no evidence of religious coercion, it remains a regrettable idea. Evidence is lacking. Uh, though there is an anecdote of the master's landlordly use of authority in church life when it comes to the first few pastors... Latouche apparently took sole responsibility for employing pastors during the early years of the church and is reputed to have invited one to tea at Harris Town House, suggesting afterward a time of prayer together during which the master asked God, quote, to open a suitable sphere of service for our brother who is now concluding his ministry amongst us. Uh, notice was thus served and the poor pastor went home to pack. However, I can happily report that Baptist patterns of congregational government have since been added uh, to the early foundation of Baptist doctrine and teaching. The early growth of the church uh, congregation in Brannockstown led to the need for a larger place of meeting, and in 1882, a little chapel was erected. It was described at the time as an elegant Gothic structure built of chiseled limestone with arches faced with red sandstone and a vestibule forming part of a massive tower surmounted by a red sandstone spire. The interior featured a polished pine lining on the walls up to what was described as the usual height, uh, along with a tiled baptistry and windows glazed with, quote, a light buff and green tint which diffuses a very pleasing radiance through the building. And it does. It was regarded as seating 120, which by my calculation makes the average 21st century believer uh, around 120% of the physical size of his or her 19th century counterpart. Uh, to put that more straightforwardly, I think we can just about squeeze in 100 today, or 30 to 40 with social distancing. At next door to the church building, Latouche erected a manse that is still in use today, uh, inhabited by the current pastor and his family. And there's no mistaking the association of the two buildings, sharing as they do uh, not only a, 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 a boundary, but several points of connection, both of architecture and of building materials. Now, at its very height, 
uh, in the summer sunshine, the church building set amongst towering trees and green lawns is, uh, is handsome indeed. Um, now, of course, for much of the year, it is somewhat more gray, drab, and even damp than this, although it does rather stand out in heavy snow as well. This second photo was an attempt to imitate the earlier shot taken in summer uh, during the infinite, infamous snowfall of the Beast from the East in March 2018. Incidentally, that snowfall was so severe and the roads to the church so treacherous that we actually canceled a Sunday service, which in March 2018 seemed a most extraordinary measure. Little did we know that in March 2020, we would begin a time when we could meet in person on only 13 of the next, uh, I think it's 61 Sundays. Uh, it'll be a long time before we complain about disruption from snowfall again. In 1880, Latouche oversaw the founding of a school in the village, uh, with a school building being erected with the aid of a state grant, opening in 1885 as Brannockstown National School. It, it operated for 20 years in close connection with the church, and then closed and later reopened in 1928 uh, under the management of the local Roman Catholic diocese. Uh, the school gained a new building a few years ago, uh, during the construction of which classes were held in porta cabin style modular buildings installed on our church grounds, and since left to the church as much-needed halls. Uh, the school recently closed again for a year during a further change in management, and has been recently reopened by the local education board as a multi-denominational community national school. It's great to see the school thriving, even if the disruption of the last year and a half has been very difficult for pupils and teachers alike. In the early 1880s, there were around 30 church members in Brannockstown, with congregations regularly reaching 80, with some folk coming five, six, seven, even eight miles to attend, which was a greater feat then than it is now. Now, obviously, the experiences of some of our older members today reach barely halfway back to the 1880s, uh, but several can recall times when young friends or siblings would travel to meetings by shared bicycle. They would set off with, uh, with one riding on ahead before leaving the bike at the side of the road and walking on. Uh, friends would come along further behind, and whoever was last would collect the bicycle overtake the others, leave it in the side of the hedge, and walk on. Uh, and in, in that way, everyone had part of the journey on two wheels. The congregation to this day is quite spread out, as many rural Protestant churches are. Our two most distant regulars live 80 kilometers or so apart. Uh, now, for those to whom that means little, imagine the church in Antrim, drawing a few members from Belfast in one direction and Ballymoney in the other, not to mention uh, many from Randallstown, Ballyclare, Templepatrick, and Crumlin. I hope that's a sufficient translation to give an idea of our spread. Other meetings, uh, both organized and impromptu, were held in those early years in neighboring towns and villages and also at the Curra Camp, home to a large portion of the armed forces, as it still is today. And during the family's time living next door to the church and manse as Harristown House was repaired, Mrs. Latouche describes an occasion uh, when two loads of soldiers from the Curra attended a service in Brannockstown. She writes, As we sat at dinner, I saw all the arrivals and heard the opening hymn, Onward Christian Soldiers, taken so fearfully slowly that one felt the Christian soldiers did not mean to hurry themselves and evidently wished to remain non-combatants. <laughs> uh, one of the pastors in those early days was Archibald McCaig, native of Scotland and recommended to the church by the Reverend Spurgeon, having graduated from Spurgeon's College, where he later returned to teach for many years. John Latouche died in 1904, 
At that time, the pastor of the church was Ambrose Berry, uh, who was also, uh, at a time, an assistant pastor at Harcourt Street Baptist Church in Dublin, uh, which meets today in Grosvenor Road. As far as I know, Berry was the only Kildare native to pastor the church, and he went on to become principal of the Irish Baptist College. Uh, but I'll leave it to others to determine whether that move was a promotion. Before his death, Latouche wrote to the church at Harcourt Street, asking for the church in Brannockstown to be taken into its care. And it seems that for a time, the members of Brannockstown were welcomed to Harcourt Street and that the church in Brannockstown may even have dissolved for a time. The early 20th century was certainly a lean time for the church, reflected in a paucity of records. Uh, But the dedication of lay preachers and the help of local Presbyterian and Methodist ministers kept services going and made sure that God's word continued to be preached. Students of the Irish Baptist College in Dublin also undertook preaching duties for many years. In 1947, one of these students, J.A. Ritchie, became the first full-time pastor since the death of John Latouche. Pastor Ritchie's widow actually wrote to me very warmly from her home in Scotland at the outset of the the current pastorate in 2016, with the church still uh, dear to her. During Pastor Ritchie's time, several new families began to attend, and a Sunday school opened with 18 children on the roll. Pastor Ritchie moved on to Limerick, and under subsequent pastors, there was a growing emphasis on youth work and evangelistic outreach. In 1964, the longest pastorate of the church began with the appointment of Robert Dunlop, who served the church until his retirement in 2006, a remarkable service of of, of 42 years. A native of County Monaghan, he served for three years as a Baptist home mission worker in Athlone before accepting a call to pastor the church here in Brannockstown. Now, under Pastor Dunlop, the church adopted an updated constitution. A Christian Endeavour Society provided fellowship and service for teens and young couples in the 1960s and 70s. Extensive work was carried out to the church property, including the installation of central heating, for which we are grateful, and the erection of church halls. Uh, Over 20 years on Sunday mornings, Attendance grew from the mid-30s to the mid-60s with almost 30 children in the Sunday school. A boys' brigade company was formed in 1980, which I believe is unusual in Baptist circles, and it was certainly the first in a Baptist church in the Republic of Ireland. An annual summer camp was also established in the early 70s, welcoming and teaching as many as 80 children. And Baptist youth evangelism teams would come and supplement the evangelistic endeavors of the church in different ways. 1972 saw the establishment of a truly ambitious, creative, and visually striking ministry, the Church Mobile. Uh, Services and evangelistic meetings were taken on the road with regular ministry established in places like the neighboring county of Carlow. I've personally lost count of the number of people who've mentioned the church mobile to me with fond, fond memories, whether Baptists from elsewhere in Ireland or local people, uh, some of whom still remember it well. I believe that Ireland's Church on Wheels operated for 12 years, visiting towns, villages, and fairs, a remarkable effort and commitment. Pastor Dunlop's voice became familiar to RTE radio listeners as well as he was given opportunities to broadcast, often speaking of God's great salvation. No doubt he would have been quick to adapt to the current needs of live streaming in the midst of a pandemic. Uh, He was also a keen writer with an interest in faith, history, and even poetry. Pastor Dunlop retired in 2006 and was laid to rest in the church graveyard after his death in 2014. Uh, The church today, in its 150th year, give or take, continues to enjoy God's blessing. We are a group of 27 members with around 40 adults and 30 children meeting each week 
or not meeting, as the case has been for much of the time around this anniversary. Uh, We are thinly spread in geographical terms, as I mentioned, so we look to make the most of our times together, often taking almost as long over coffee on Sunday mornings as we took for the service itself. Uh, This photo is a couple of years old now. We are a multicultural bunch with accents from Canada, USA, Colombia, Chile, Nigeria, Germany, England, Scotland, Northern Ireland, even a few native Irish voices. It's actually a lovely global group and makes for a genuinely exciting bring and share lunch. Alongside our our church-wide midweek prayer meetings and Bible studies, we have groups for the men and women in the church at meeting for fun, for fellowship, for outreach, and for reading and discussing books together, the, the latter carrying on over Zoom in recent months. In recent years, two key ministries of the church in the community have been uh, our, uh, our youth club, attended by young people of whom uh, most are otherwise unconnected to the church, uh, and our toddler group, welcoming and befriending a small group of mums and young children week by week. The summer camp that began in the 1970s runs today, or or will again soon, we hope. Uh, We've been delighted to welcome some bi teams to help with that in recent years, and they've enjoyed themselves here as well, I think. Um, From time to time, we've held events alongside the Brannockstown Village Committee, including a summer fair, a harvest festival, and a live nativity complete with, with stalls, with actors, with scripts, And with animals, including sheep with the shepherds, a donkey with Mary, and of course, two of the llamas uh, which carried the wise men. Uh, We had fun, we raised money for charity, and we took a few minor creative liberties. Um, One of the opportunities that particularly excites us at the moment is that about which you may have heard on Missions Night earlier this week. Uh, We are sending one of our families to France in partnership with Baptist Missions and uh, and with our association of Baptist churches in Ireland. It's so exciting for us to think that as the, the history of our church began with Christians leaving France for Ireland, so the near future of our church involves sending some back from Ireland to France. Uh, Would you join us in praying for the Sandal family as they soon depart, uh, God willing, and for us as we learn to support them from afar as their home church? And do subscribe to Baptist Mission's prayer updates to hear snippets from them as they settle into life there. It's an excellent collection of little prayer postcards that uh, drops straight into your email inbox every Friday like clockwork. Now, there's more that could be said, but perhaps it would be fitting to end with some sentiments of Pastor Dunlop, written almost 40 years ago, but still appropriate today. He wrote, by and large, we can be humbly thankful that we have a happy and enjoyable church fellowship. In being alerted to our deficiencies, limitations, and peculiarities, we must not lose sight of the steady, regular and faithful service rendered each week within our ranks. We stand on the threshold of a strenuous advance into that unknown but enriching future, which is as bright as the promises of God. May he, through his grace, make us worthy of the honor and equal to the task. Thanks so much for watching, for praying, and for taking an interest in our church. God bless.